Episode five of Sir Ulrich Host Money Matters. Last week was James Lavish dropping knowledge, demonetizing Keynesian education. We will continue with a pair of Boston locals that are partnered with him in the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund. Larry Leppard, Larry Lepard, and David Foley. I'm honored to have you two sitting with me on the Money Matters show. David, um, it's been a while. How are you today, man? Hey, good. All right. Great to see you. Doing well. Right on, right on. And Larry, brother, how are you? It's all good. You know, we're um, we're going to record highs and all the sound money assets. So nothing wrong with the world. Right on. Yeah, I just want to plug that um, when I first went to my, when I went to my first Bitcoin conference, uh, I remember noticing Larry Lepard from the from off in the distance, Anders and Pubby. <laughs> Uh, introduced me to him and I was like oh man that's Larry and he was with Greg and he was with uh I think you were with some uh, something you were in a business meeting and you stopped that business meeting to take time 30 seconds to say hey I know you from Twitter like you're great like you shook my hand you gave me a hug and you know that that interaction really stuck with me, and I, I really appreciate that to this day. And I just want to, you know, thank you publicly for that. Thank for you, that, man. Engagement. We're, we're brothers in arms in the sound money fight. I think you stood up for me on Twitter, and and uh, I never forget that. So <laughs> thank, thank you so much. So, anyways, um, I, I again, I love having you both here. Um, I want to get, I want to get going. I, you know, this is almost like a series with James. Uh, last week he was fun, and he, you know, he dropped a whole lot of knowledge that helped me, helped my listeners. I, but I never got a chance to talk to him about the actual Bitcoin Opportunity Fund where you guys are partnered. So. If you could, David, um, the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund, last week he, uh, James was on, couldn't explain it. Maybe you could break break that down for me. What is exactly the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund? Yeah, absolutely. So we are a, a hybrid hedge fund and venture fund in the Bitcoin space. Um, James Lavish and myself are co-managing partners. Larry, Greg, uh, Mark, and Corey are advisors, um, and we are looking wherever there's value and growth opportunities in the Bitcoin space, public or private. So that's why we are a hybrid hedge fund where we can do public investments, everything from Bitcoin itself to MicroStrategy to the public miners um, to Block, uh, names like that. Uh, we can do portfolio hedging through that hedge fund vehicle as well. That's important that we want to do to try and dampen the volatility and create better risk adjusted returns. And on the private side, we've done a handful of investments since we closed the fund. Um, we, we did our first close uh, last summer and did our final close here in February. Um, so we're a small fund, but uh, but we're doing a lot of stuff uh, in the private space too. names. Um, we've done our own private mining. We've done uh, situations where we have bought Bitcoin and lent it to Bitcoin miners uh, such as Cormint that will um, their you know, top of their capital st st uh, stack, first lien security. And we earn um, uh, we earn Bitcoin on our investment, and we also got warrants in that business. Uh, names like Anchor Watch, uh, Ocean Mining, uh, Custodia Bank, and and a few others that are teed up right now uh, in the space. So we're we're very excited about you know both public and private opportunities in this space, and trying to help build it out. Uh, and we think there's a lot of good risk adjusted returns to be had over the next several years. Okay, now here's now here's a question. You know, me coming from the engineering world, you know, I, I, I and anyone who wants to look it up, they can know. I, I generally work on satellites for a living, uh, and the the macroeconomics, the hedge funds, you know, the finance world is kind of novel. What's the difference between a managing partner and like you and James, and then the type that's Lawrence, uh, Greg? Corey, what's what's what what are your different roles um in that regards? Yeah, so James and I kind of are managing day to day, calling the shots on the investments themselves. Uh, Larry and 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 Greg and, and and the advisory team are and Mark and Corey are uh, you know sounding boards where if we're doing certain private investments, we're talking with them a lot. We're constantly talking, you know, we have weekly investment meetings and we're going through the portfolio with them of what we're doing getting their opinions and insights. Um, they're obviously very helpful too, in terms of deals that we're being introduced to uh, through each of them. Um, and so just from a great sounding board and strategic guidance, I mean, Larry's got so much experience as a venture capitalist before running his own hedge fund. And uh, 
it's been really helpful for us to kind of get Larry's input on, uh, you know, growth businesses. You know, Larry can tell you that, you know, he was in the dot-com VC world back in 1992, first hearing a, a guy hand him a business card saying such and such dot-com and thinking, what the hell's dot-com? I better. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so it's really helpful for me and James to kind of use Larry a lot to get his opinion and insights and experience. Right on. Um, to to um, to Larry, like, and another question about this opportunity fund. I remember Greg uh, Greg on his on his uh, I would say his uh, I don't want to say tirade, but that's how that's how it comes off. But when he when he's talking about the Bitcoin opportunity fund, he was really adamant about getting a certain amount of capital, and I forget if it was ten million or one hundred million. What's the what's the the reason for hitting that threshold of 10 million or 100 million, whatever you guys were going yeah. for, I forget numbers, zeros escape me. Yeah. But is there a certain reason for hitting a certain threshold? Does that give you more leniency with laws? What's what's the deal with that number? Yeah, to be well, to be, I think it's a couple okay. things. One, um, I think it was a Bloomberg article that ran with it saying it was 100 million our fund, and that, that was not true. What, 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 what we said was the maximum we would ever raise was 100 million. Now, in okay. the event, I think we were hoping to get to about 25, 30 million dollars of, of capital raise. Uh, and we raised in the middle of a bear market and we didn't get there. Our assets under management are 20 million. Uh, so we, we didn't meet our goal. But but mm -hmm. I think to answer your question, Ulrich, is what Greg's referring to is just getting to scale where you're a yep. sizable right. firm that can write meaningful checks to companies or opportunities to try and grow um, those enterprises. So uh, that was the goal. And, and again, we came up short, but we're, we're, we're undaunted. We feel really good about the opportunity proud of what we did during a bear market when no one would take our call we, we, we could barely get any institution or family office to really be interested they, they said ah oh, crypto's burnt out they, that's dead and uh and we said look bitcoin's different than crypto and um and it's weird right kind of at the end then we were getting phone calls from people like hey i'd like to invest and it's funny how that works but um you know look we're, it doesn't matter we're, we're we're doing what we're doing our, our blinders are on of finding good businesses and, and opportunities to make money for our for our clients i and bet they're they're thirsting now go ahead larry you yeah i just something? point out that the way just that people are curious the way these funds operate because they do private investments is they you have a you have a last closing so um you know they raise their money it's done fund one if, if you wanted to invest in fund one now you couldn't it's it's already done and that fund will play itself out however um they will put that money to work and will need more capital and fund two will be coming at some point in the future. So people who do want to invest in this kind of a thing, um, and by the way, Fund One has great results so far. So, um, you know, Fund Two will be coming at some point in the future and they, you know, mm -hmm. the, the balance of Fund One will be co-invested alongside Fund Two. And I suspect that based on the success in the track, Fund Two will be substantially bigger than Fund One. So this is kind of the model that venture capital firms have worked under for years and years where they, you have kind of a series of 10 year funds um, and you need to because the private investments are illiquid. And because of the illiquidity in the private investments, people can't just come in and out. You, know, you can't put your money in the fund and change your mind and say, I want to pull my money out because your money might be in a private company that can't be sold. So, um, you know, that's kind of the mechanics of how it works. Right on. And so you you did mention something in particular. You mentioned a um, the fund, too, which is coming in the future. And what's also coming in the future, uh, if we track Bitcoin, is essentially we're not done yet with this bull market. Um, the halving is coming in a couple of weeks. Um, generally, historically speaking, I know we don't, you know, history doesn't, you know, doesn't necess necess uh, necessitate, you know, future outcomes. But a few months after the halving, we end up having this this blow off the top high, and a lot of Bitcoiners are expecting that. But then after that blow off the top high, there's another future, and we kind of scale back, we correct, we go through a, bull, a bear market phase. Um, Bitcoin Opportunity Fund isn't just going to disappear during the bear market. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask, what's your change in investment strategy during that time frame when you're reading the tea leaves and you're saying oh damn like things aren't uh things aren't going up forever laura um either one of you guys whoever wants to answer that but how does your strategy differ in let's just say a 2026 time frame yeah i i'll go first and then you know larry feel free to pipe in uh, it you know i think that the answer is 
it doesn't really change, right? Your process theoretically stays the same. Like, you know, we can get, I guess our view is that Bitcoin is two things, right? It's a store of value. It's digital gold. It's exponential gold. I've heard someone say, I think it's a great line. Timmer, yeah. Scarcity of the asset, right? That it, it, it's, its supply will not change relative to its growth in price. And, and that's probably the one thing that I think even Bitcoiners don't fully appreciate. Um, and we can get into some of that of where we think this will have a squeeze moment, a GameStop like moment in a crisis because of that scarcity. So we think as a store of value, this is, you know, for all the reasons, right? It's, it's gold is still going to be a good store of value too, in our opinion, but it, Bitcoin is truly unique in a, in a growth uh, position um, from that point. The second thing is Bitcoin's a network and a technology and, um, and, 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 a, uh, and, a, and an immutable ledger that uh, will also transform so many businesses from bankings to trading. I mean, there's so many derivatives companies we're talking to that are starting up derivatives exchanges that will be more peer to peer, right? With instant settlement, you won't have to have T plus two settlement and having bankers involved as middlemen. It's just going to be a digital world going peer to peer and where we can all through the ledger understand each other's uh, transparency and risk. So I think that where I'm going to answer your question is that that's the long term play out here. And whether it's a bear market like a year ago or two years from now, if that comes again, the process stays the same. Find good businesses at good valuations with management teams that really understand how to grow business and build a team that know how to uh, husband capital and not throw it away. Uh, and really invest well. And, and that's what we're in search of. And, and that's whether that's public or private, uh, it doesn't change. It's it's really that, you know, Larry and I always talk about this. This is our job. Our job is to evaluate and analyze businesses and management teams and make the best judgments. We're not perfect. It's not a game of perfect, but it's a game of really getting just the best risk adjust returns. Across yeah, it's, all, it's all probabilities. I mean, Alec, I think I think it's important to, to point out that we agree with Sailor. It is going up forever, Laura. I mean, there's, okay. there's, no, there's no doubt. We think that Five years, it'll be higher. Ten years, it'll be higher. Fifteen years, it'll be That's higher. Right. Twenty years, it'll be higher. Having said that, we've also observed the history of how it trades and how it performs. And um, you know, you can you can use various models, and a lot there's been a lot of argument around these models. And we don't put enormous faith in any of them, but we we do consider them. And and you know, certainly the history has been that you know around the halvings and with, with a certain secular regularity, it becomes very stretched compared to its 200-day moving average or what we call the Meyer multiple, which is the, you know, the price of Bitcoin as against its 200 day moving average. And, and history would show that when it gets that stretched, I mean, unless maybe on the last time when we go to hyper Bitcoinization, you know, there's, there's some argument for lightening up, you know, at those high prices, um, recognizing that they might've been driven there by people using leverage. And as that leverage unwinds, you're gonna get a chance to buy it cheaper in the future. And that's yes, certainly sir. happened four or five times, you know, cyclically through you know the bear markets and the and the or the bull markets and the bear markets, and we think it will continue to happen, perhaps to a lesser degree, uh, with each correction being not as severe. And we've seen some of that already. The volatility is coming down. The corrections are not as deep as they were. And so, you know, what it might mean is, I mean, when it was at 15, 20, 25, we knew it was deeply undervalued, and we were pressing it hard, you know, in terms of options and and owning it. Um, you know, if it's at 200 or 250 or 300, um, it'll be hard to make an argument that given the kind of the historical trends, the power law, the stock, law, whatever you want to use, that is cheap. That it's, and, and so, you know, I think, again, it just comes back to probability weighting. We would probably just lighten up. You know, we would still own Bitcoin. We just wouldn't be, you know, balls to the wall owning Bitcoin, recognizing there's a chance we're going to get a chance to buy it cheaper, you know, on the next correction. So. That's and, and that dampens out the volatility. And we think investors can and will pay for that because, you know, they can't watch it every day. They don't have the, you know, all the models we've got. You know, we're, we're buying all kinds of analytical data um, from Checkmate and, you know, all these other guys. And, and uh, you know, it, it helps to kind of give us an edge of knowing when to push it, when to push it. Right on. Uh, I, pre I appreciate that answer. And yes, if we zoom out enough, of course, it is going up forever, Laura. Um, and we're trying every day to convince all the no coiners out there that this thing is changing the world. And so, and so I want to go back to something that that has always been in the world. 
uh, and gold and silver. James last week mentioned <laughs> silver and gold as a as a basket of protection against the effects of runaway debt. Is gold and silver actually holding its relative buying power, not its dollar value, its relative buying power in any category at all over the last 5, 10, 20 years? I want to get both of you guys' opinion. I'll start off with Larry. Uh, yes and no. I mean, it depends on if you believe the inflation numbers. I mean, gold historically over very long, long periods of time has kind of gone up at 7 or 8% in nominal terms. And I think inflation has actually been running higher than that. So I don't, I don't necessarily think it's been protecting your buying power, but it's been, a, it's done a better job of protecting your buying power than cash or bonds. I mean, you know, long bonds are down 50% in the last few years. Um, and, and it is, you know, it is until Bitcoin came along, it was the best form of sound money. It had the best, you know, stock to flow ratio, et cetera. Uh, and that's not going to go away. It's very widely accepted, widely held. You know, we all believe in Bitcoin and no Bitcoin is a superior you know, monetary technology, but we also, you know, can, can accept that gold will go higher nominally because fiat is going lower um, nominally in terms of its purchasing power. So uh, silver is a different beast. It's uh, it's more volatile. There's not nearly as big a stockpile of it. Um, it's got two roles. It's got the monetary role, which has kind of been demonetized over the years. And the company, the countries that bet on silver made a mistake. Um, and, you know, China and India and others and safe pointed that out. Um, but but it's also got another piece to it that's interesting, and that is it's really it's a great conductor, and it's heavily used in electronics and solar. Um, and you know there are studies that show that if we continue at the rate we're going in solar, places like China might demand half of the silver we produce every year, and it's in as you know as few as three or four years from now. So um, so there's going to be a bid for silver uh, based on the solar application. So. Um, <laughs> You know, so they both work. They both protect it to a degree against monetary debasement. You know, we just we make no bones about it that, that Bitcoin, although more volatile, um, does a much better job of protecting against monetary debasement. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I mean, I, I think, by the way, I can share if you if you remember to share a screen there's some good charts that we can point to as we're talking through it. But <laughs> if not, or yeah, well, here, here's what here's what we can do, and I don't mind this being on. Uh, do me a favor and, and uh, drop the link in the comments, and I can share the screen uh, with the audience. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, I got you. Well, yeah, some of it's well. In any event, I'll I won't go there too much. But it, it to Larry's point, I mean, since 1971, the U.S. U.S. money supply M2 has grown at seven percent a year, right? And mm -hmm. sort of the extent that, as he said, if gold's holding value, it grown at it price is seven percent plus, it's holding value, right? But it's not um you know totally crushing it but it's holding value what's interesting to us is that the gold miners and silver miners the gap in those relative to the price of gold and silver bullion is so massive it's just it's on his back and so like in my head i think of gold and silver miners right now as value investments and i think of bitcoin and the whole bitcoin space as both growth and value investments and and it's it's just turbocharged growth ahead. And, and so <clears throat> to me, it's a good balanced portfolio of sound money strategies. And, and we won't even get into the fact that, you know, again, some of these charts on Bloomberg that um, I'll try and paste in here in a minute, but we, we, you know, kind of think that the commodities have been way underinvested in over the last 12, 14 years and the stock market has just gone to the moon. And so you've got in Jeff Gunlex talked a lot about that, right? That, that essentially there's going to be a comeuppance where you're going to realize that stuff or commodities that have been underinvested in are short in supply. And as this inflation continues to persist over time, those commodities are going to be massive outperformers relative to stocks, which, you know, the stock market right now, David Rosenberg will tell you is at 21 times earnings. And yet at a four to five percent 10 year treasury yield, you should be at like 15 or 16 times. So it's probably 25% overvalued. And so why is that? Well, the market's basically pricing in that NVIDIA's growth rate in earnings is going to grow massively and all these other names too. And, you know, that could happen, but the probability of that is very low. Mm -hmm. And usually what happens is those industries get oversupplied and suddenly Google's competing against NVIDIA for chips and the growth's not there and we get overcapacitated. And this is exactly what happened in 98, 99 and what happened in 06 and 07. And then you get these, you know, bubble pops. And, and to us that, you know, we're, we're sitting here on these commodities that are just going to ride this inflationary wave. And so I'll pause there so I'm not long winded, but that, that's where we see 
gold and silver as uh, miners as value investments in, in the whole Bitcoin space's growth. No, yes, sir. I appreciate that. Um, and I, I think I want to tug on the gold string a little more. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think go back to uh, go back towards a, a na- the narrative behind gold. And we talk about gold has a track record. And it's like people have this this generic response when you say gold versus Bitcoin, Bitcoin versus something. That other something has a track record, even equities. Google has a track record. Google's been around for 20 years. Bitcoin has been around, or at least publicly traded for 20, 25 years. Bitcoin's been around for 15. Track record. We People use that phrase, track record, gold, 5,000 years, even though, it, of course, it hasn't been going up in value for 5,000 years. My question to you guys, and I'll start with David, what do you consider to be a legitimate track record before you say this thing is legitimate? God, great question. I mean, you know, I, I would argue that, you know, it's it's probably at least five to 10 years, right? And, and I think that, in other words, sometimes like I don't beat myself up. I can remember Larry talking to me in 2015 or 16 about Bitcoin. And and I, I was like, no, I don't see it, Larry. I, I can't see it replacing gold. But I don't beat myself up on that because one, it's just my nature to kind of watch downside protection first before investing. But I think Larry was able to see that growth early. I wish I had listened to him and convinced, but but I don't beat myself up because it was still early. I mean, Larry will tell you that in 2013, you know, him talking to MIT coders that, um, or you know, that that uh, that said, look, there there is risk that you know they worry about certain things. But yet, I think when we get to that five, ten year moment, you've got a real track record. You have an opening. It's hard for the government to come and prohibit, you know, create prohibition on it. Um, it's a network effect now that has grown. Um, so. Yeah, certainly gold still has that 5,000 a year uh, advantage, but but I think Bitcoin in this era too of social media and the world being flat, the whole world knows about this asset. This is different than 1933, and it's very hard for the government to do a 6102 like they did on gold and, and ban the ownership of it. It's very hard I think, right. to do that nowadays because you have rebellion throughout the world. Yeah, I, I think 15 years is enough, Ulrich, as you know. I mean, it, you know, it, it's, um, look, it, uh, there was a time when it was risky. The first five years of it were extremely risky, and kudos to Max and the others who just assumed the problems would get solved. Mm. But I, you know, I didn't know they'd get solved for sure, And but they have gotten solved. You had, you had block wars, you had hard forks, and all kinds of things that, and there were even back doors that got closed where we discovered, you know, late in the game that things could have gone wrong. Fortunately, the core developers figured it out and fixed it. But, um, but I now think that with 15 years, you know, 800,000 plus blocks, and you know, no, no significant technical problems, um, that you know, this is. And, and by the way, it's the best performing financial asset ever by an right. enormous measure. Um, you just can't ignore it. And and I think that's what's really starting to dawn on Wall Street and and investors in general. You know, I mean, investment is all about performance. And, uh, you know, you can say whatever you want about Bitcoin. You can, you know, call it funny money or, you know, I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of stones that people throw out. The fact of the matter is it has outperformed every other financial investment the last 15 years. I think it has for the last 10 years as well and maybe perhaps even the last five years. And so, you know, with that as a track record, you know, Wall Street and, and traditional investors can no longer ignore it. And by the way, they've now got an easy way of buying it with the ETFs. And I was saying on a podcast I was on yesterday that I, I actually think today, buying Bitcoin today at 70,000, where we are technologically and where we are with the ETFs and where we are with the, the government having effectively endorsed it by letting the ETFs occur, I think it's a lower risk bet today than it was when I was buying it back in 2017 or 2018 for five or 10,000. Mm-hmm. So the price was lower, but there was a lot more uncertainty at that time. You didn't know, you know, wh- where it was going to go. I mean, a, a lot of traditional financial people I know said, yeah, I get it. I like it. I, I understand why you're calling it digital gold. The government's never going to let this happen. They're just going to shut this thing down, you know. And, and I mean, that was always potentially a risk. Um, but, you know, obviously three judges, you know, in Delaware ruled, you know, against shutting it down. And, and I think those guys will go down in history as being brave men. Because effectively that created the ETF, which then opened the doors to just enormous amounts of capital that are going to come into this category and 
shove these prices. I mean, people are going to be blown away. Everyone thinks seventy thousand is too high, and they've missed it. They're going to, they're going to be completely <laughs> shocked. Wait till they see the next ten years. You know, I mean, it's it's going to really. I think it's going to shock people. I absolutely agree. And it's so funny how the whole ETF dynamic comes around at the same time when the cycle the cycle is going through its time when it's like we expect an all-time high. And of course, that capital probably couldn't come into Bitcoin without the ETFs, but it's almost like it was d- divine intervention. I'm not trying to get hyper spiritual about it, but it's like, oh wow, first we had first we had um you know, first we in the first phase, you know, it was almost like this this thing where only drug mon- drug drug lords and and criminals used it, and then it became something more of a a, an, a hyper early adopter where people are 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 tech curious, and then you have like in 2017 to 2021 where it's like okay now it's like like Coinbase is established and so now you get you get p- more people involved. Um, but of course, FTX was there as well, so it blew everything up. And now we're in this like this next age where now it's been legitimized. You have the government uh, saying yes, you can you can sell it on Wall Street. And so every phase, like there's this new wave of capital, and it's exponentially growing. And I can only imagine what the next four years. I mean, we're 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 st- we still haven't hit the, this cycle. Uh, I mean, this happening. What's going to happen the next happening? You know, oh, that's what right. type of I mean, people are going to be. You yeah. know, when you think about the expansion of the internet, you know, are people in India and Africa are going to be like, yes, this is easy to get to where it wasn't right now? Go ahead, Larry. You were going to uh, say, I was gonna something. say, I mean, it's this brought in Wall Street, but, and, you know, we've got one nation state, El Salvador, one, and we've got no. one country, we've got one company, MicroStrategy. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, Michael Saylor has created just enormous value in MicroStrategy by keeping his treasury reserves in this asset. You know, there are, you know, 500, there are thousands of companies in the world that have large treasury reserves. I mean, how long until somebody else figures out that this is a smart thing to do and they start to copy them? I mean, El Salvador has, has you know, benefited their company, country enormously by, by hodling Bitcoin. You know, how long until other countries do the exact same thing? I mean, I think probably there are a couple that are and they're being quiet about it. But my point is, this, this goes to the game theory. I mean, you just you just can't ignore it and you can hate it. And you can say it's no good. You can say whatever you want about it, but it's just, you know, it just keeps marching along. And, and so you're going to be forced to come to terms with it sooner or later, because in, in, in Bitcoin terms, everything else gets cheaper um, because Bitcoin gets more valuable, you know, consistently. And, and that, that goes back to something that I think you've touched upon in your pods, Ulrich, but I'll just reemphasize it. I think it's so important to why this is occurring. I mean, we have never had an asset like this. We, most commodities are, are structured in a way that if the price goes higher, we'll, we'll produce more of them. I mean, the price of oil doubled tomorrow, we drill for more oil. Price of gold doubled, we'll, we'll mine more gold. Price That's of right. corn goes up, we'll plant more corn. There are 21 million Bitcoin, period. <laughs> and, and some of them are lost. And it doesn't matter where the price goes. There aren't going to be more than 21. It's a, it's a fixed supply. And so here you are, you have a commodity with a fixed supply. And the only way to get them is to pay the market price. And, you know, right now we've only got, you know, I don't know what, maybe 100 million people that are aware of it and participating. And there are 8 billion people on the planet. You know, there are 54 million millionaires and there are 21 million Bitcoin. Every millionaire in the world couldn't even own one Bitcoin. So, you know, that that's that's a telling statistic. I mean, there's 300 trillion of fiat stuff, gold, silver, I mean, uh, uh, you know, cash, stocks, bonds. And there's 1.4 trillion of Bitcoin. What happens when that 300 wakes up and says, you know, uh, we're getting debased here. I, I don't like it. I want to buy something the government can't print. Well, they could buy gold for sure. But, uh, you know, the, the, if they want to buy the faster horse, they're going to buy Bitcoin. So That's right. That's right. Um, okay. I want it. So now we've, we're talking about the government. We're talking about a little bit of the macro um, forces. I want to go through a little drill with both of you guys. Um David, you know, you're more of the reserve one. You don't post as much as Larry, I swear. Larry has Larry has three posts a day and he's getting into fights. I'm like, I can't even do that. I don't know how you do it. But there is something that Larry brought up, and I'm gonna bring this one up and 
I also want Dave and basically I want both of you guys to talk about something that concerns you from a macro uh, economics perspective, traditional macroeconomics perspective. Larry, you mentioned Treasury issuances back up to 2020 levels in a recent tweet. I wish I had the tweet to pull it up, but I'm, I'm sure you were posting it, was, it, it was, recently. It was Monday. Go to my Twitter feed and look at this Monday because I'll Street, try to pull it up Wall, while you're talking. Wall Street Journal yeah. article came out with it. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, average interest rates on those T bills are 5.25 to 5.5. So I want to know a uh, percent. I want to know why this concerns you. Explain to the audience. And while you're talking, I'll try to pull up your Twitter. Yeah. I'm sure James uh, covered this with you. I didn't have a chance to listen to that yet. But this goes to the debt doom loop or the debt, you know, death spiral. And, and that is to say that, um, you know, the U.S. federal government is the largest debtor in the world at $34 trillion of debt with an average interest rate in the low three range. And yet, you know, all the Treasury bills are selling at higher rates. So that was, as we refinance that debt, our interest costs will be higher. Our interest cost is currently running at $1.1 trillion per year. This is ours, I say, the U.S. federal government. And, you know, you get into a, a vicious negative feedback loop where um, as interest rates go higher, the cost of financing the government debt gets larger, the deficit gets larger, therefore they have to sell more bonds, selling more bonds creates more supply, all else being equal, supply and demand, the in, you know, the price of interest is the cost of, you know, satisfying that supply, finding buyers for that supply, so the interest rate goes higher. And of course, then the federal interest expense is higher and the deficit's bigger. And you can see where I'm going. It's it's a doom loop. It just keeps getting worse and worse. And the only way to arrest that doom loop is for interest rates to come down or for the government to try and balance their budget. Um, and, you know, good luck on getting the government to balance their budget. They've got their foot on the accelerator and they keep pressing it extremely hard. Yeah, that's great. There's the tweet. Yeah, I mean, look at this. We are We are financing as much debt as we financed at the COVID peak. Isn't that stunning? I mean, it's, um, and by the way, we were spending close to what we were spending at the COVID peak. So COVID was obviously an emergency and they had to take emergency measures in terms of debt issuance and spending, but the, the emergency has gone. I mean, in theory, the, you know, the economy is ticking along. Unemployment's relatively low. Inflation has come back down a good bit, not as far as they want. Could and, it be, uh, and let me interrupt you, could it yeah. be that the emergency, even though COVID was what COVID was, and people have different opinions on what exactly it was, could it be that the emergency really is the dire circumstances of just fiat in general, that it is actually unraveling before our eyes and we have to do things that, to our mo monetary system, that looks like we're in a pandemic and really everything is normal? Yeah, exactly. I think that's exactly right. I think what you've described is that, you know, the monetary system is broken and, you know, the debt issuance is reflecting that. And the reason that's occurring um, is that, you know, they, they, they have to continue to increase the debt in a Keynesian system. And this is my, my pin tweet, which is to say, which basically says that you cannot grow your level of debt. This is like a household. You cannot grow your level of debt in excess of your GDP growth because the blue line is the GDP growth. And that's what's used to service the red line. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so if, you know, I mean, this is a this is a classic chart. This is a Herbert Stein's law chart. If something cannot go on forever, it will end. Now, it has not ended yet, and it's that's gone right. on a lot longer than I thought. And it could there, there's some who argue, perhaps correctly, that it could go on for another ten or twenty years. Yeah. I tend to disagree with that. I think that we are getting closer and closer to the point at which it breaks for good. But, you know, that's that's a matter of debate and probabilities and who knows. Um, but the point is, this is be this would be like a family that's, you know, making fifty thousand dollars a year, but spending, spending and borrowing, 50. Yeah. Yeah. Three hundred exponentially more every year, <laughs> every year. Right. And I mean, a, a great example of this, uh, Ulrich, which I'll just point out. I mean, Biden just came out with his projected budget for twenty twenty five and he projected they were going to spend seven point three trillion dollars and grow the expenses by 12%. So they're, they're going to grow government expenses in the next year that he proposes growing government expenses 12% in the next year. Well, GDP is not going up to 12%. So that's nice. Okay, I get it. You guys want to print, you know, you want to spend at a 12% growth rate. Where are you going to find the money to do that, guys? You're not going to get it out of GDP growth and tax revenues. You know, the answer, in my opinion, is you're going to find the money to do that by printing money, which is what that's you've right. done in the past. And, and that printing money, I mean, it's like 
pouring water into beer. You're just diluting the quality of the beer. And, and that's why, you know, the inflation that I think we've seen so far is just a prelude to, to continued inflation over the rest of this decade. David, what about you? What What is something that's tugging at you from a macro perspective that seems to be like we're in trouble or we're in trouble, but not so much? What are your thoughts? Well, I think I'll take I'm trying to share my screen here now. I don't know if that went through. We'll see. If you can't, you know, I'm, I'll be honest with you in the audience. I'm new to this tool. So if you can, do you have the do you have the text, um, the text uh, window? I, I, yeah, I tried to paste it in there. That's all right. I won't bother okay. that. I, I tried right. to. But it, essentially, you know, just take what Larry said. If you looked at that chart that he had, you know, it's really since the 1980s, we've just seen this debt really start to slowly skyrocket, then really increase, and then really just kind of a straight shot parabolic move, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look back, you say, well, how have we gotten away with it? Well, in the 1980s, you had Microsoft and Intel coming along right. to dampen some of the money printing inflation, right? We said money supply grows at 7% a year over 50 years. Then you had the internet in the 90s. Um, and you just, you, you had Michael Milken though along. So think back to the eighties where I remember being a kid getting credit card applications, six of them every day in the mail for the family. And as a kid, and, well, not for me, but the family, oh, okay, right? about to say about the family, right? So, so, they were so desperate, we, yeah. America was slowly getting a yes. consumer credit. Then the nineties came right. along and Michael Milken and the junk bond market. And, and well, again, like everything in moderation, it can be good. Like what Milken did creates liquidity and, Mm -hmm. And in the 2000s, it was a securitization market, and and we have the internet to keep inflation low. We have the WTO approves China in, in in 2000, and Walmart then was really benefiting from that, and we Walmartized America, so we kept inflation low, but yet this keg party of debt was going on, and. In 2007, it came to a head. It really, it came to a head in 97 with the Asian contagion and 98, the Russian blow up and then long-term capital management. And the Fed put their put in and bailed it out. And that prolonged to the next bubble in 07. And then when that blew up on Wall Street with Lehman Brothers levered 80 to one and Goldman Sachs 32 to one, we bailed that out. And that's why you begin to see this parabolic move in the debt. And so like where I look at, you were asking macroeconomic where I think this goes wrong. Like to me, this smells a lot like 98, mm. 99, where it's like within the next two years, the probability of something really busting and, and just how fragile this economy is, is massive. Uh, right. So for instance, to Larry's point, this debt bubble now has ended up in a cul-de-sac of the Fed, the Treasury has basically financed 40% of the debt with, that matures inside of three years. We've got the baby boomers that are 71 or 72. All of that $200 trillion of off-balance sheet debt is coming due. You can't kick the can on that. You've got stories of Citadel doing basis trade, levering up 57 to 1 to trade Treasuries. I think that there's a little bit of a speculative bid, not only in the stock market and tech, but in all assets. And the question is, is what trips that up in the next two years? And and then how quickly does that come crashing down? And to me, it will come crashing down like it did in 98, 99, 2000, like it did in 07, 08. It, it, the debt matters. It's a fragile system and it's even more levered than it was. And to finish the thought, I think what goes wrong this time is you're going to have a sovereign level create debt issue, right? This is not just at Wall Street banks anymore. This is at the sovereign level at all of them too. It's every central bank. It's every treasury. And so what will happen is people won't go running to the flight to safety of treasuries in the next crisis like they usually do. They will look for neutral reserve assets such as gold, silver, Bitcoin that have no counterparty risk mm -hmm. and they want to park it there. And that's why Bitcoin will be like Michael Burry's credit default swap, big short, because it is so scarce. So to put numbers to it, out of 19.6 million Bitcoin that have been mined so far, probably in my opinion, conservatively, only about probably three and a half of those have been lost. Probably at least three will still be sticky hodlers, even at 250,000 a coin. Right. So if we sit there in the next crisis a couple of years from now, Bitcoin's at hypothetically 200,000 
and we call it 15 million Bitcoin. That's $3 trillion market cap of free float. And yet, what if I told you that 5% of bonds and 5% mm. of cash, which would be about $20 trillion, is coming looking for that $3 trillion of Bitcoin and gold and silver. But you get the point. $20 trillion of cash and bonds looking for a neutral reserve asset versus right. $3 trillion of free float. That's GameStop. That, that, that's, <laughs> that's where you, you will see this thing spike to a 10 standard deviation move beyond the trend line that the power law guys talk about which I think right. is interesting theory, but you will see a massive standard deviation move in my opinion. And it's because I've been long winded. It's because this is a levered bubble. We thought long-term capital management 101 was levered. This is at every level, sovereign through corporate, through consumer. This will be massive. And I, yeah. I, I'm not given the hyperbole, but I'm, I'm, I feel that one of my bones this is going to be your flight to safety, Bitcoin. Yeah, there's, there's been, I mean, one of the things, uh, Ulrich, I think it's really helpful to point out is just how much money we've created over the last right. four, four years. I mean, you know, and and, and the, the the alarm bell used to be gold, but they learned, they figured out how to suppress, suppress the price of gold. But, but there's actually a pretty interesting mathematical thing that one can do. If one goes back into the 60s and 70s, when we were on a, a, a gold standard, at least on an exchange standard internationally, you could take the U.S. monetary base and you could divide it by the 261 million ounces that the federal government owns. And you came up close to the $35 reference price that they set at Bretton Woods. If you do that exact same calculation today, you take the monetary base and you divide it by the ounces of gold that we own. Gold would need to be at $80,000 an ounce. Okay, 80000 It's trading at 2225 right now. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, there's been a 40x growth since 1971 in the money supply i mean it's it's insane and you know and that's, and that's only and that's only in america i mean well we that's, don't right. Even know. that's right this is a worldwide phenomenon in fact yeah. one of the big one of the most egregious things one of the things people aren't watching right now we're going to talk about this in our quarterly letter is china is printing like crazy i mean the u.s right now is actually trying to be restrictive because Powell that's is right. trying to be volker but china is, <laughs> is undergoing somewhat of a problem and you know, the, the Chinese monetary growth that you pulled up on TradingView, I mean, it's it's crazy. It's It's been going up very, very rapidly. So so the point is, this is a worldwide problem based on the, the way the system is constructed. And um, all that us Bitcoiners or sound money folks are doing is looking at the construction of the system and saying, huh, we know what's going to happen here. I mean, yeah, fits and starts and, you know. I mean, the Fed balance sheet is an interesting story, right? It was less, it was 800 billion before the financial crisis in 08. That took it from 800 to 37. Then they brought it down a little bit. You know, then they had the repo blowout and, and COVID. Then it went from 37 to nine. Now they've brought it back down a little bit. But guess what? We know what's coming, right? <laughs> we know that something, as David points out, the highly leveraged system, sovereign debt crisis, something's going to break. And they really only have one tool, which is the printing press. I mean, they can't say, you know what, we're going to let interest rates go to their natural level. We're going to just let the entire economy collapse and we'll start over again. I mean, that's just not one of the possible choices. I mean, from their point of view, because, you know, they would have, you know, riots in the street and, and politicians would be tarred and feathered. So uh, <laughs> what they, what they do, especially but, during an election year, you can't be tarring and feathering me yeah, when exactly. I'm trying to get in office. Yeah, right? What they will do is they will they will you know, satisfy themselves that, hey, you know what? That's a little right. inflation is not bad. I mean, you're already seeing some of that. You know, you had Krugman saying, well, maybe the target should be 3%, not 2%. And you've had a lot of our, you mm. know, arguing that, you know, yeah, right. I mean, it's, I mean, they will choose the inflationary outcome. How do we know this? Because they have to. And because they've historically, we know it for two reasons. One, because they've always done it. And we, furthermore, we know that mathematically they have to, or else the whole thing will collapse. So those two things, I think, allow you, me, David, everyone who's in this sound money bet to sleep quite well at night, knowing that our savings and, and, and our purchasing power is going to be protected. Um, the difficulty, obviously, though, is that, you know, there's volatility and it's not in a straight line. What, what we're describing does not happen in a straight line. So is there something, you know, it's so funny. We talk about, you know, the breaking down of this financial system. And I just feel like there was there were pangs or hints of that when we when we harken back to January, March of 23. I think it was probably March of 23 when the when Silicon Valley Bank and I think two others, Silicon Valley Bank and two others just basically imploded. Absolutely. They collapsed. Absolutely. Yeah. That and was what happened when that happened. 
Bitcoin didn't say, oh my gosh, Bitcoin, like we're running away. No, people ran to Bitcoin. It essentially sparked, in my opinion, it sparked, it sparked the bull market. It was like, okay, we were going down to 15. Boom, we're right back up to 22. Let's get it popping in the positive direction. Imagine that happen, happening with one of the banks in China, one of the big four banks in China. Imagine that happening with one of the big four or five banks in the U.S., you think people are going to say, oh, we have to go sell all our Bitcoin? They're going to be running. That That's a trigger to hyper-Bitcoinization. It's crazy. I, I, what I are you guys' thoughts I, on that? I completely agree with that. I mean, I thought in March of 23 um, that, that that was going to kick off a big run. And to their credit, to the other side's credit, they did a good job of sticking everything back in the can. You know, they were talking about guaranteeing $17 trillion worth of bank deposits. And, you know, she didn't have to do She didn't have to do that, fortunately. But uh mm -hmm. But they, you know, they were able to, to kick the can further, and they're and they're good can kickers. Don't let's not they are. Know, give them their give them their due, and that's why you know David and I can't sit here and tell you you know this is going to work in the next three months. I mean, we have no idea when. Right. I mean, I'm very comfortable about the direction over the next two to five years, but I'm very uncomfortable about making predictions about exactly when it's going to work. But I'll, I'll let David comment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, it's it's. It's really what Larry's saying is that at every moment in time, whether it's long-term capital management in 98, whether it's, hell, in 97, the IMF was bailing out, you know, Russia and, and Asian contagion. I mean, they have no choice. And this is this Lynn Alden chart that I, I'd love to share, but I, I, I'll figure that out later. But it, you know, effectively that Lynn has that great chart of total debt growing and M2 base money supply growth with it because you have no, they have no choice, whether it was Silicon Valley Bank last summer or the UK guilt crisis the summer before that, they have no choice but to throw money at the system. Otherwise, you're going to have it crap down. And what I'm worried about, as Larry said, at some point, I think in the next two to five years, I grew that. I, it kind of feels more like two to me. And I'm, I usually don't give in to hyperbole it just feels like this is going to this debt is massive and it's it's everywhere um and i think that what will happen is they will be forced to just bail it out though like they did with silicon valley most recently and, and i think that um yeah there it is okay it's coming up and and so this is lynn's chart right that as debt grows you know the m2 is forced to just to keep growing with it and what happens is they've tied they've taken the m2 down here over the last kind of year and a half or so and, you know, you've seen things like the UK guilt crisis, you, you, rates went higher. You've seen kind of issues with Silicon Valley Bank. And and ultimately, in this next crisis, they're going to you're going to have this debt jack massively again because of demographic reasons of baby boomers aging with Social Security and Medicare bills coming due and they're not working as long. And and it's hard to then raise taxes on the youth. So they're going to have to step in the central banks and just flood it with money to support it. Otherwise, you're going to tax the hell out of the 30-year-olds that are already struggling with student loans and, and cost of housing, that politicians, it's much easier just to print it. And I, we haven't even gotten into the pension funds that might collapse. I mean, God forbid if we get stagflation, because if rates are going out to 10% globally, like K Katie bar the door, like this will really get ugly. And that's what I worry about. You asked that question originally, is in a stagflationary scenario, like this is really scary. And I think, again, it's good news for probably Bitcoin and gold and silver because those will be those neutral reserve assets that people move into, not treasury bonds, because nobody buys a treasury bond at a 5% yield, fearing that it's going to an 8% yield. That's a money losing bet. So God help them if it's stagflation. So I think that, you know, that that debt chart of lens combined with what Larry was talking about earlier of this is the U.S. Treasury maturities. It's all front end loaded. I mean, give Steve Mnuchin credit. He at least tried to go float 30-year and 100-year treasury bonds five years ago, not, or six years ago. Mm -hmm. The market had no demand for it because they see what we all see. Here's interest rates going up relative to that short-term treasury. And again, as uh, is, is you guys have talked about here, you got um, this this chart here of, of, of Larry's he's talking about, just the debt since 1980 just spiking relative to income. And it's led us to that cul-de-sac of those short-term maturities. And at each instance, the Fed is forced to come in and do QE and bail it out. I mean, here it is post-08. We thought that was a big move going from $1 trillion to a $2 trillion Federal Reserve balance sheet, their total assets. They did QE all the way along the way, some QT in there, but they never really could do much of it because stuff was breaking. And here's the 
big QE move by Yellen in, in 2013. The sin of this is they kept rates low at the same time for a long time. And Jay Powell tried to take it off. We had the repo crisis. We had the stock market melting down at Christmas of that 18, 19, uh, and then COVID. And, and so most people would say, yeah, fully, that was a one-off thing, COVID, where they had to jack the money here. And, and I would argue you say that, but again, we go back to our debt problem, that when you have this kind of debt maturities and you have a rising rate environment, again, God forbid, bid if this thing is stagflation and rates keep going higher because this will get ugly it's this lin chart though that the base money has to come in to support an over levered fragile and system david go go up again to the fed balance sheet the one with the pictures of bernanke and yellen on it i i find that it's, it's extremely there you go i find extremely notice the colored lines at the bottom okay these were those colored lines were all what the what the fed was saying and predicting you know we're gonna i mean I'll never forget Bernanke testifying in front of Ron Paul saying, of course, we're going to take the Fed balance sheet back to a trillion dollars. You know, that's the plan, right? Well, how did that work out, right? <laughs> and, you know, and they've said it all along. And, and, the, and, and the fact, I mean, they're lying to us. The fact of the matter is they can't. They absolutely can't because of the, the math surrounding the GDP to debt that, that, that is my pen tweet, you know, which is just that, I mean, they've got to support the, the system. And when you have debt to pay back and you have a shrinking money supply, you know, the, the debt defaults and a default is, you know, that's what happened in the thirties. And that's, that's the great depression, which is the Holy grail of macro. And they've all vowed that they will never let that happen again. And so, so, so we really know with very high confidence, what's where we are going. What we don't know is the shorter term path. And, you know, and so if you're trying to get every wiggle, this is a really rough game. I mean, you can't be leveraged. You gotta be super careful. But if you've got savings and you can take a five to a 10 year view, it's pretty damn simple. Just buy Bitcoin and forget about it. <laughs> you, know? I mean, you will you will protect your purchasing power or silver and gold if you don't want the volatility of Bitcoin. I mean, I think, you know, gold for, for old, I've said many times for older people, gold is a decent choice because, you know, Bitcoin does have drawdowns. And I think Bitcoiners who don't admit that fact and, and address that fact do a disservice because I feel terrible for the people who bought, say, pre FTX at 65. It went to 15. They didn't understand what they had. They thought they'd made a mistake. They panicked. They sold it at 15 and they lost money. Whereas if they had just hung on, they'd be back to a, a position of being, you know, everybody who's been in it is now in a profit condition, you know, even if you bought it before FTX. That's right. So, um, and and I, I believe that will continue for the next 30 years. So, yeah, I do think that the, uh, the cyclical dynamic of Bitcoin is a is a form of price discovery, and right now it looks like it's in a in a four year cycle, and that's exactly what it is. Probably related to the halvings, and so people generally who can who can afford to have a low time preference uh, benefit, um, whereas right. like you said, the older people if they need their money now. Um, and they don't want it to be blown up with their local currency. Gold seems to be a good option, uh, potentially a short, less than four year option. But as we've seen, any any four year, even at the worst of times, even if you bought it, you know, uh, the worst of 2020, you know, 2018, 2019, uh, what ends up happening is at, if you hold for four years, you're generally good. Um, can you afford to hold four years? Can you afford to hold eight years? It will do you. Uh, it will do you a good service. I want to talk about that kind of long, that long-term perspective for the last uh, five to ten minutes we have. You know, there there are multiple ways that that our fiat system could essentially fail. Um, and I would say to you guys, and I'll ask David first, if you can put on your kind of like future goggles, what does the world look like when money printing is essentially incapable of solving the pro uh, the world's problems in the short term? Um, and, we're, and we're not just talking about people who got, big, hey, I got Bitcoin, I'm good. What does it look like for people who essentially don't have any Bitcoin? Um, David, you first. Yeah, well, look, I mean, obviously the extremes are things like the Weimar Republic or more recently Venezuela and Argentina and Turkey, right, where Argentina inflation is running at over 200 percent right now as we speak. Now, look, I, I, I hear people griping and saying, well, that's the, we're talking about the United States. It's not going to happen. The dollar is the world reserve currency. And, and I get that it, it, it is. But, but I think that if you have a debt system 
where just like during COVID, where the money supply was growing at 20% a year for two years. I mean, think about that. For 240 plus years of existence in the United States, we printed 40% of every US dollar ever created in those two years, 2021. And I can hear people griping and saying, well, come on, that was COVID, it was a one-off thing. But they're ignoring that this is a debt bubble now and how fragile the system is. And in the next recession, and if God forbid the stagflation, th this is massive how much money printing it would have to happen. So could you have inflation running then, therefore, monetary inflation, at kind of north of 15 to 20 percent in the United States or 30 percent. I think you could. Maybe it's not 200 percent of Argentina, but that's massive debasement. And and then inflation and Tavi Costa has put a lot of great stuff out on Twitter on this. It, th th that is a monetary phenomenon then, where you have this inflation that just compounds. And, and now it's based on expectations. That's where this blows up quick. And so what that looks like is more and more people moving into neutral reserve assets, Bitcoin being the biggest leader. And that's why if I were folks at home, I would be setting up a dollar cost averaging product where every week I'm putting away a certain amount of money and buying the ETFs of Bitcoin. Forget about they don't want to get into cold storage because it's too complicated. They should be doing that. And I know someone would say, well, you're, you're just trying to preach your book or talk your book. And you guys are all preachers in this Bitcoin space. And it's not. We're just monetary historians that understand what the probabilities here are. And we understand portfolio diversification and that it's important. Like the only wrong answer is 0% exposure to this. Everyone should have 1% to 5% of their assets at least in these sound money assets. And they should be doing on a dollar cost average basis. That way they're not emotional about where they're buying it. If Bitcoin is at 70,000, then goes to 60,000. You're just constantly buying every week. I'll pause there. I, I think that that's how you play defense against that. Yeah, I, I think David really nailed it. I mean, to, to where the world is going, um, you know, look, I, I don't want to be I don't want to be a doomer. And I've been accused of being a doomer. Um, so I'll, I'll try to avoid you can be that. a doomer on my show because I yeah, but I'll, I'll try I to avoid you guys the, the doomer like it. outcome because it's kind of it's probably a tail event. I mean. Here's the optimistic thing. I mean, look, I think it's quite clear that it's very likely that we have inflation, that inflation becomes a serious and consistent problem. Um, I was speaking with a gentleman last night about this particular subject, and arguably it's in the context of a world where the economy is pretty healthy and everybody's employed and wages are going up as well. So, you know, maybe you could just have a period of high inflation and we could work down the debt as compared to the GDP and you know, uh, all live happily ever after, after this inflationary period when they, you know, they kind of reset the monetary system. I mean, I think that's the, that's the good case. We just have high inflation. We all suffer, but, but we make it through it. You know, the obvious, the tail case and, and perhaps the bad case is that high inflation becomes really high inflation. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then, you know, then sadly, you know, a lot of things break and a lot of people get hurt, particularly people who are living on fixed incomes or, you know, are trying to live off their savings. I mean, you know, in an inflationary world, I mean, I think a lot of how this will affect people economically depends upon their age. I mean, if you're if you're older and living off a fixed income, inflation can ravage you because you can't go back to work and you can't make income in the new you know currency. Um, if you're young and you have a highly inflationary period, well, you know, if you've got a good job, you've got skills. If you're if you're a worker, OK, fine. So it hurts you. But maybe you don't have a ton of assets. Maybe you don't have a ton of liabilities. You know, the inflation was a was a rough patch. But you've got the next 40 years of your life to, you know, in the new system to make money and to have it all be pretty good. I think eventually we will come to. The, I mean, I think this is a fourth turning that we're in. And I think that we will come to the conclusion that the problem you know, that we're facing here is a monetary problem. I mean, fix the money, fix the world. I mean, as I think Robert Breedlove has done a nice job of talking about how, you know, the, the, the question for our age for this fourth turning is what is money? And I think what we've relied upon is, is Keynesian fiat money. And that was a mistake. And, and that's, I think, becoming more and more obvious. And frankly, we need to fix that mistake. And I think we will fix that mistake because at some point in time, the inflation will be so painful, so persistent, so consistent that, you know, the people will rise up and, and a, a candidate will arise, a, a political candidates and others will arise like a Ron Paul or whoever. And, and say, you know, we got to fix this. We've got to return to a sound money standard because this is literally killing all of us. And it will be demanded and it will occur. 
And, and this is the bright side. This is why I'm not a doomer. I think on the other side of it, once we return to sound money, things are going to be fantastic. We've got all, you know, if we don't, if we don't get into some big shooting war and don't do a bunch of stupid stuff, you know, um, we've got, you know, a great productive group of people. We've got incredible technologies. I mean, look at how much better the world is technologically now than it was in the 60s or 70s. And, you know, and we've got more technology coming at a rapid pace. I mean, look at what AI is going to do. So, so it's, it's really a very, very bright future, in my opinion, once we cross this chasm of broken money and getting back to a sound money standard. And, and I think at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, that, that we will actually be, and I don't know where the dollar will go, and I'm not going to sit here and talk about hyperinflation, how the dollar is going to fail. It doesn't really even matter. I think we'll just start pricing things. I think we'll have these parallel systems until we start pricing things in sats. And it'll be like, okay, well, that steak costs 35 sats and, you know, that house costs 150,000 sats and, you know, whatever it might be. And um, because this will be the preferred means of money. Everyone will go, okay, yeah, I, I know what Bitcoin is. I know what a sat is. I know, they're, I know they can't print them. Um, yep, I'll accept those for sure. You want to sell me something? Yep, here's my sat price. And, you know, and, and by the way, I think that'll be a fantastic world. It'll be a really great world. But, you know, as, as Dave is pointing out, I mean, between here and there, obviously, they're going to be bumps and it's not going to be fun. I mean, you don't go through, you know, the history of fourth turning show that there's, you know, there's a lot of turmoil. And I mean, that's sad, but it is what it is. I mean, we made the wrong monetary choices years and years ago and we're living with them. You know? And so we just got to We got to get to the other side. I guess that's how I view it. In just 30 seconds to build on that point to By me, all means. what Larry just talked about is what I think the analogy is, think about the hippies in the 60s that became aware of the government kind of aligned to them and having 57,000 American young 18 year olds dying in Vietnam and questioning the government and protesting. I can remember being a kid in high school studying that and saying, geez, these hippies seem like they were loud and radical. And mm -hmm. as I got older and mature, you realize, no, it's that generation that defines how the future is going to look. And so it's some 28 to 38 year old out there. These are the leaders of the future. It's not Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell. It's not lifetime politicians from either party. And in my opinion, both parties are lousy. And I think that what will happen is you will have that type of awakening that then led to things like Watergate, where you really question the government and people then realize in this fourth turning that, yeah, they all lied to us. Pelosi was getting wealthy. Elizabeth Warren got wealthy. I should be careful. I live in Massachusetts, my senator, but let's call it what it is. And I like the reality is that that, that some 25 to 38 year olds are going to change the world. And that's how the system works. And you can be caught up in it thinking that Nancy Pelosi is going to live forever and, and Mitch McConnell and they'll set it. They won't. And, and this is these young people will have to change it because they're pretty mad. They've got their spears and pitchforks in the form of digital technology that will change the world. And, and I think that that's the curve we're riding here. And that's just what we'll look out. It's unclear on the timing, but that's the future. For people, like I, I spoke to a group here of people my age that said, well, I don't get Bitcoin. It's like, well, you should have one to 5% because this is what the future looks like. I'll pause there. It's it, it All those points that you guys have made in the last five minutes really sum up the reason why I have this show i uh, you know it this show isn't for this show isn't for oh like let's just you know be talk about how fun bitcoin is there we are in a we are in dire straits and the world is changing and the world yeah. is changing for the better but like lawrence said it's going to be there are going to be bumps there's going to be bruises people are going to get hurt so the best way to protect yourself is essentially to put your savings whatever you can uh, in that asset, neutral asset, as as David says, um, that won't get blown up when this monetary system, this monetary experiment gets blown up. Um, and we don't know when it will be. It could be five years, 10 years, 20 years from now. But you can see from the charts that they posted that yeah. things are not getting better. And I will say, I don't think it's 20. I mean, if you want my kind of mean expectation for when we're back into sound money land, it's kind of some point in, sometime in the early 2030s. And that's six yes, years sir. away. So that's certainly, you know, that's certainly some time. I mean, I, that's why I still think we're early. And I think, you know, people looking at it today, I say, well, I'm late to this game. It's 70 grand. I can't buy it now. It's too expensive. No, 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 no. 
you haven't seen anything yet, in my opinion. You know, you're 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 if you're listening to this, you're early. And the reason why is because it's not about seventy thousand. It's more about the one point three trillion of total market addressable cash, market. Total addressable market here versus seven hundred to nine hundred trillion of global financial assets. So sound money right. assets are less than one percent of global financial assets today. In nineteen eighty, after that nineteen seventies period, they were seven to eight percent. Sound money assets were seven to eight percent of global financial assets. So. This is earlier, whether we look at Metcalf's law and, and, and we're probably, you know, one to two, some put say 10 percent penetrated globally of ownership in Bitcoin. That doesn't seem right to me, but I'll concede that some people that think we are, you're still early. It's usually another now it'd be 15 to 20 years before we get to 80 to 90 percent of the population having meaningful amounts of Bitcoin. Yeah. So this is a small asset class. It's really early. I think dollar cost averaging and diversifying your assets, not putting 100% into anything, not into uh, not into 100% of your assets into the, the equities, not 100% into bonds, not, diversify. But but again, you need to have some exposure to these sound money assets. It yeah. uh, Again, I, I think commodities, digital commodities of Bitcoin or gold and silver, these are going to have massive tailwinds over the next decade. Ulrich, let me um, let me draw a parallel too that I, I used in Madeira and I, could, I think I could use it here that'll it may yeah. help people. It, um, I mean, this is one of those investments you buy and you never sell, and it's because it's at the base layer of money. And I, I had a similar experience earlier in my life, earlier in my career, and I kind of blew it, but it, you know, I learned from it. Um, and that is in 1980, the IBM PC came out. In 1983, you know, I met Steve Ballmer, and he said, mm -hmm. you know, this, this thing we've got, this core level software thing we've got allows you to run these PCs, and everyone's going to have one. In fact, everyone's going to have multiple PCs. And everyone's going to need this thing because it's the it's the kernel that makes it all work right and you know this is going to be a multi hundred million dollar if not multi billion dollar company you know and, and and that was 40 years ago so it took time for this to play out but what he had it was right he had the base layer software of an enormous technological innovation which is really what bitcoin is it's digital scarcity is an enormous technological innovation and you know it slowly but surely penetrated the entire world and you know microsoft is a multi-billion dollar corporation today and that stock has been a five thousand bagger and you know i bought it in 83 i sold it a few years later to buy a condo at 3x my cost which was a mistake mm. but but the point is that you know i i see kind of the same pattern here you know i think this is the base layer of money um i think it's in it's a superior form of money and generally the superior technology wins we know that and and therefore it's just it, it's going to continue to relentlessly grow and you know i see bitcoin at hundreds of thousands of dollars per coin and then at a million dollars per coin and then at multiple millions of dollars per coin and yes. I, I think i think it's just kind of relentless now you know that's over a 10 15 20 year time frame what i described with microsoft took 40 years to unfold so you know and, and that's sometimes people want things to happen more quickly well you know, patience is somewhat required, but if you've got something that's working and going in the right direction and it's compounding, um, you know, you stick with it. I mean, as long as the dogs keep eating the food, you know, I'm going to stick with it. I mean, if, if I saw, if I ever thought that Bitcoin adoption was slowing, I'd change my view on this. But as you and I both know, it's been growing very consistently for many years now. And I think there's nothing that's going to stop that. This this has been a great time. I could tell that you guys have passion, and I love that the passion that you bring to this show. Um, we're definitely going to be exploring the laws of exponentiality uh, on this show in the near future. Jeff Booth is going to be coming on in May. I can't wait. And I hope to have both of you guys on uh, in the near future again when you're both free. Um, oh. Thank you so much for being on oh, the show. Thank you. It's always great to be with you. Thanks, Ari. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, so I appreciate Larry and David. I, I wanted to say that Larry and David coming on to share their expertise, experience, and valuable opinions on how Bitcoin and central planners' decisions affect our future world. Uh, check out the show notes for Equity Management Associates. That's where they're both, uh, that's the company that they both own. And of course, the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund, where David is a managing partner and Lawrence is a partner. I am Sir Ulrich, like my father before me. See you next week 